well, uh, here we are again, and um, you've uh, you've come for the midweek video, and uh, you'll know that in this midweek series we're in the book of Hebrews, and we're in the chapter of Hebrews 11, and we're in that chapter all um, uh, that, that is all about faith and what faith looks like in the life of God's people. And the the author takes us on a tour around the hall of faith, where the portraits of the faithful are hung, and uh, we gaze at the faithful saints of old, those faithful Old Testament characters. And today we look at Noah. And Noah is, it's a classic, isn't it? It's a classic children's tale. And it's included in all of the, the kids' Bibles. And it's a story that um, I've told my kids again and again and again. And what's not to like? I mean, it's a great story for kids, isn't it? It's got animals. It's got a big, uh, big man with a white beard, a really cuddly and jolly character. It's got a boat. It's got water. And then it ends with this rainbow in the sky, which is a picture of God's love. I mean, it's great, isn't it? Or is there more to it? Well, there was uh, one time I remember reading the story of Noah to my children uh, one night. And uh, one of my children said, Daddy, they pointed to the picture. They pointed to the water. And they said, Daddy, what's underneath the water? Well, that was not what I was expecting. There's lots of questions like that, isn't there? That uh, stop you in your tracks. And I said, well, Darnham, what do you think is under the water? If it was going to be fish, then we would say, yes, it's fish and move on. But my child said, people? Is it dead people? Well, I knew at that point we were never going to paint that mural on the, the children's room wall of Noah and the ark and the flood and the rainbow. Because even though it's on the walls of Sunday schools and children's hospitals and it's a feature in all of the children's books, there is something that lies beneath, isn't there? Literally, something that lies beneath the water. And maybe we skim over the surface of the story of Noah and we don't delve into the deeps. Well, in Hebrews chapter 7, we are not allowed to do that. We are taken into the deeps in Hebrews 11 verse 7 as it talks about Noah's faith. So let me read it now. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 7. By faith Noah being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen in reverent fear constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. And we pray, saying, Lord, please help us to dive deep into the story of Noah, even as it's told in this one verse. Help us, Lord, um, because this passage might indeed teach us that there are things that are, are lacking in our faith that we need to uncover. Father, take us on a journey as we look at this one verse and the faith of Noah. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So as we often do, not always, but often, very often, we're going to have three points as we look at this passage together. And yes, often they begin with the same letter and I am not going to disappoint you tonight. Why? bring more change into an ever-changing world. We're going to have three C's tonight. We're going to see that Noah constructed by faith. Then we're going to see that Noah condemned by faith. And then we're going to see the third, that Noah championed faith. He's a champion of faith. So there are the three things that we'll see in this passage tonight as we delve into the deeps of the story of Noah Constructed, condemned, and championed. 
Noah constructed by faith. We see it there in that verse. By faith, Noah being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. Noah teaches us about faith that is rooted in fear. Now, there are a dozen or more ways that we could misunderstand a sentence like that and get it completely wrong. One example, someone who is faithful in their attendance of church out of fear for their father. Example, someone, and people say things like this to me all the time. My father was a strict man and I went to church every week faithfully because I was afraid of a slipper. He would give you a terrible clip. Something like that. Someone who fears the consequences and they are faithful as a result. That son or daughter driven to faithfulness out of fear of fatherly discipline. That's not the type of fear that we're thinking about that produces faithfulness. Though sometimes we could think like that. We might think of someone who is terrified, afraid of hell. So fear alone drives them to trust God as rescuer. And the story of Noah is not the story of a man who builds a boat out of fear of the oncoming flood. It's sort of, but not completely. Noah is saved by God's grace. We read in Genesis that he finds favor in the eyes of the Lord, the grace and favor of God. And then because he is a man who has uh, who has, has found favor in God's eyes, he builds an ark. That's why this phrase, reverent fear or holy fear, as it's translated in some translations, is important. Noah is a man who walks on earth and walks with God. Remember last week, the previous week, it's still there if you want to watch it, if you haven't seen it yet, about Enoch and how Enoch walked with God. And we understood that that meant that he agreed with God. He agreed that God was there, but he agreed with God's will and God's word and however God had revealed his ways to the people. Well, Enoch was a man who agreed with God. And the same is said of Noah in Genesis 6, 9. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. Noah demonstrates reverent fear, not because he's afraid of a flood, not because he's frightened of God, or simply in awe of God as creator but because he trusts God, because he walks with God, because he loves God and he knows that God loves him. And because of this, Noah desires to obey him. He walks in holy fear. Spurgeon, a great preacher, says this, a great preacher of hundreds of years ago says this, holy fear leads us to dread anything which might cause our father's displeasure. Noah wanted to please God and the thought of in a way breaking God's heart, well Noah just didn't want to do that. Someone says this about holy fear. It is a fear in adoration of God that dreads sin itself, not just sin's punishment. For one has come to treasure God and so loathes all that is ungodly. This is the holy fear in which Noah lived, that by faith we are called to live. Calvin puts it like this. The pious mind restrains itself from sinning, not out of dread of punishment alone, but because it loves and reveres God as father. It worships and adores him as Lord. Even if there were no hell, it would still shudder at offending God alone. This is the righteous and holy and reverent faith that Noah lives in. Fear and faith. 
Noah acted by faith as he constructed, having been warned by events yet unseen. Remember, we also saw last week that Enoch, Noah's great grandfather, or no, Noah's grandfather, um, acted as a prophet. And Enoch, we're told, it's recorded in the book of Jude, spoke a word of prophecy, a word of judgment. And his words were a, a words of warning for Noah's generation and all the generations that come uh, beyond that, that the Lord will bring judgment. Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear constructed an ark. Noah heard the words of Enoch and he believed the words of Enoch. He could see no signs of a flood. He could hardly see the, the water, um, maybe from where he was, but he still acted and he built an ark. Faith is taking God at his word out of holy fear, not in order simply to be saved or in order to be blessed, but in order to please God. Reverent fear, like Enoch, like Noah, means that trusting God's ways are better than our ways or the ways of anyone else around us. The word fear grates with us, doesn't it? Righteous fear, holy fear, whatever kind of fear, it's, it's something that we don't want. We don't want to live in any type of fear, but, but we do. We often live in anxiety and fear, and that's because we don't fear the Lord as we should. Reverend fear is proper, right fear, and it puts all other fears into place. Because Noah fears the Lord, he doesn't fear the frightening world around him or the frightening worldview or the frightening members of the world. Do you remember the context in which Noah builds? It's a world in rebellion to God. That's the days and the years before the flood. And Noah could rightly fear men and women around him, but he doesn't. And he doesn't because he fears God. The Bible says the fear of man is a snare, but the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is a delight. One is a snare, one is wisdom and delight. So we're called to free ourselves from the anxiety that this world brings us by fearing the Lord. Let me read a, a little section from a book about the fear of the Lord. And I'd love to visit, once I've read this book, I'd love to tell you a wee bit more about this topic of the fear of the Lord. And maybe we'll do that in the, the midweek, in the weeks ahead. We'll take a wee break and look at this as a subject. But listen to a quote from this book. As a whole, we are an increasingly anxious and uncertain culture. And therein is an, or an extraordinary paradox. For we live more safely than ever before. Though we are safer than almost any society in history, safety has become the holy grail of our culture. And like the holy grail, it is something we can never quite reach. Protected like never before, we are skittish and panicky like never before. How can this be? Quite simply, our culture has lost God as the proper object of fear. That fear of God was a happy and healthy fear that controlled all our other fears, reigning in anxiety. With our society having lost God as the proper object of healthy fear, our culture is necessarily becoming neur is necessarily becoming more neurotic and anxious. In ousting God from our culture, other concerns from personal health to the health of the planet have assumed a divine ultimacy in our minds. Good things have become cruel and pitiless idols, and thus we feel helplessly fragile, and society fills with anxieties. That's from Michael Reeves. Later on in the book of Hebrews, we will read that godly fear stills the storms of worldly anxiety. And Noah demonstrates this. Before the flood comes, he is in the storms of a wicked world. And he's able to stand for 120 years 
and build this ark to the scorn and the mockery of those around him because he fears the Lord. He can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? This is the holy fear by which Noah constructed the ark. Noah constructed by faith in fear. Second, Noah condemned by faith. Verse 7 again, the second part, by this faith, he condemned the world. Daddy, what's under the water? Well, the whole world is under the water. The whole earth is condemned in Genesis chapter 6. This is a terrible moment in history. But like other moments in the Bible, it's only a shadow of what's to come. The flood in Genesis 6, the wickedness of Genesis 6, is a picture of a world more full and more wicked. A world in which we live in and a world that's getting worse and a world that will not face the floods of judgment, but the fires of judgment in the days ahead. And in this world, Noah seeks to be a herald of righteousness. Let's read about that world as we read some verses from Genesis. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens. I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor or grace in the eyes of the Lord. The flood was promised. God promised that the flood would come. And he saved, well, all who would take refuge in him. And all who would take refuge in him, well, it was Noah and his household. But it seems that the offer went out to all. In those 120 years when Noah and his family were constructing the ark, well, it seems like he was preaching repentance and forgiveness. Peter writes of him in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, and he calls him a herald of righteousness. This tells us that as Noah built the ark over those years of its, construct and its construction, Noah acts as a preacher. The people see this practical work of Noah and they can't miss it. And along with this practical work of Noah, they hear him preach herald righteousness. It comes by faith. We'll see that in a minute, that that's what Noah believed. And he preaches with lips and life. But sadly, we know the outcome, that his preaching brought hard hearts and the people were condemned. For a moment, I want us to ask ourselves, are we following Noah's faith-filled, faithful example? And are we heralds with lip and life? Just for a moment, let's think about that. Firstly, do our lives preach? Do we stand out or do we blend in? Our kids are learning about different animals. Actually, two of them in their homeschooling are doing about uh, different animals. And one of the, the characteristics that fascinates kids and all of us about animals is camouflage. I'm going to put some pictures up on the screen and you'll see how animals blend in. How they blend into their environment for safety. The last thing they want to do is stand out and be eaten. Well, this passage tells us that Noah stood out. In love, he preached words of condemnation so that people would know their sin and turn to God by faith and find righteous righteousness and, and salvation. Noah did not camouflage. He couldn't camouflage. He was building this giant boat. He didn't blend in. He stood out with his actions. The question I want to ask, are we standing out with our actions? Or are we blending in? Are we just like the world around us? That's why we 
say nothing with our lives. Uh, we just like the rest of the world. Do we sound like them and how we speak? Never mind what we say. The words that we use, the way that we use them. How we spend our time, our talent, our treasure. Are we just like the world or are we standing out? In our worry, relating back to the last point, do we worry and fear and fret in the same way as our unsaved neighbours? Or is there a quiet confidence within us that flows out of the fear of the Lord? Noah witnesses with his life and also his lips. He was a herald of salvation. Did he share the words of Enoch that were given to him? Did he share the word of the Lord as it came to him? There's plenty of room in the ark. Judgment is coming. The floods are coming. Ah, people refuse to believe. They couldn't see it coming, so they didn't believe it. They didn't believe their ears, so they wouldn't believe their eyes. And Noah looked like a fool. And of course, we might say, well, a fat lot of good it did him. Preaching for 120 years and only eight were saved, including himself. The cynic might say that. Noah was faithful, but God didn't give any increase. But wait a wee minute. He didn't give any increase. Eight were saved. Eight undeserving sinners were saved by the grace of God. Noah's household was saved. And absolutely no one else in those days. But do you realise this? Through Noah's household salvation comes your salvation. Comes my salvation. Because the greater, greater, greater grandson of Noah came. One born in his line who saved the whole world. Those from the world who believe in Noah's greater grandson are saved. The Lord Jesus, through the line of Noah, is born. Salvation comes to Noah's household and to the ends of the earth. You might look upon your life of witness in church and you might think of the ones and the twos that came and the, <laughs> the hundreds maybe that didn't. Well, this story tells us to look at the ones and the twos. And you don't know that through those ones and twos, the whole world might be blessed. You know, imagine one day when you're in heaven and someone comes to you and they say, Sir, madam, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for teaching that Sunday school class. Okay, were you in it? No, no, I wasn't in it. And the person might say, actually, I'm from India. And someone that you taught in Sunday school, well, they gave some money. And that money that that Christian used, well, it, uh, it brought the gospel to my village. I want to thank you because you preach the gospel to that little boy and they grew up and they gave some money and the stories go on. We, by faith, need eyes to see that by word and by life, we share the good news. But the results are left with the Lord and the Lord promises that no word of his, no word of his will, will fall to the ground and go wasted. He will use it. He used the words and the actions of Noah. Noah condemns as he is a herald of righteousness by faith. Noah constructs. And then finally, Noah champions. He's a champion by faith. Noah became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Think of these men, Shackleton, Edmund Hillary, or Scott of the Antarctic. Think of scientists like Marie Curie. These folks were pioneers who paved the way. Or as we've called it with Noah, they were champions. 
champions who are the first of their field. And Noah is considered this type of champion. By faith, Noah became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. He, bec he becomes a champion of gospel righteousness. This is the only time that righteousness is used in the book of Hebrews. As Noah is described as an heir of righteousness by faith. Noah receives a righteousness by faith that he doesn't deserve. And he's a pioneer. Noah has the same salvation that you and I have. Way back then. And that's what makes him a pioneer. He is an heir of salvation just like you and I. Salvation of those who were saved in the Old Testament is no different to the salvation that you and I have in the shankle in the 21st century. Noah is a sinner saved by faith through God's gracious generosity as he receives a righteousness that is not his own. And so do you and I. We are sinners. I am a sinner. Speak for yourself, you say. I will. I am a sinner. And I know that my sin will bar me from God's presence forever. The Bible tells me that. I stand condemned because I'm a sinner by nature and by choice. That means I cannot approach a holy God. I need my sin made up for. How is that sin made up for? That is bad news that I am a sinner. But the good news is this. My sin is made up for by Jesus on the cross. Jesus is not a sinner. He never sinned and he didn't deserve to die, but he does die. Famously, Jesus dies on the cross, not for his own sin because he didn't have any, but for my sin. And on the cross, he bears my sin. And through faith in his death, I receive his righteousness. I am an heir of righteousness that is not my own by faith. This is the gospel that we proclaim. And we might think that this is something that the New Testament dreams up or something even that's talked about by Martin Luther and John Calvin. We might think that that's their concept of righteousness. But here in Hebrews, the author of Hebrews says that Noah inherits a righteousness that is not his own by faith. And he becomes a champion of that righteousness. It's a righteousness that this man can have. It's a righteousness that you can have through Christ. Noah is not saved by the works of his hands as he builds an ark. He is saved Genesis 6 verse 8, by the favour, the grace of God, and because he is saved by the grace of God, then that's why he builds the ark. That's why he climbs on board the boat and God shuts the door. And this is a picture of our faith. We are not saved by the works of our hands. We are saved by the work of Jesus on the cross when he takes our sin and he gives us his righteousness. Noah is a man who is saved by the grace and favour of God. We see him as a man who lives by faith and holy fear, who walks with God as he constructs an ark in the midst of a wicked generation. And in that wicked generation, he heralds judgment and righteousness, salvation by faith. He does that by life and lip. And by this, well, many are condemned, but his household is saved. And he stands as a champion. He says to us, you can be saved in the same way as, as, as I, by faith, inheriting a salvation that is not your own. There's only one righteous man who lived. His name is Jesus from Nazareth. He lived a perfect life. He's the son of God. He did not deserve to die, but he dies for his people, that we may be forgiven. That's the good news. And Noah points to this good news. Well, Noah is a 
champion of faith. And there he hangs on the wall, a painting of him in this hall of faith. Let's look to him. Let's bow in prayer. Our Father, we pray that we would look to Noah and imitate his faith. A faith in Christ that saves, that receives a righteousness that is not our own. We pray, Lord, that we would also live like Noah as he was a man who heralded that righteousness, as he preached judgment and salvation. And we pray, Lord, that we would be those who are guarded and saved against all the anxiety and fears of this world because we have a healthy fear of the Lord. Oh Lord, hear our prayer, for we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Well, it's good to have you watching tonight and uh, spread the word that these videos are on. Um, they're there and they're, uh, people can tune in and watch them anytime on, on uh, YouTube, and Facebook or wherever they watch them. And uh, there's other videos coming. Um, Rebecca is currently recording a series for, uh, for women and uh, teaching in the book of James. And uh, those videos are great, what I've seen so far. They are brilliant and they will be really valuable. Um, last lockdown, I didn't want to produce a lot of content. Um, this lockdown, we are um, producing a wee bit more for people to watch. Um, we're not able to get out and about. We're not able to knock on doors. And uh, this takes up a lot of time. And um, I, I, I hope you, you find it useful. So spread the word. And uh, we'll be back again with another video, more content um, on, uh, on Sunday morning. God bless.